The Constitution says that you cannot bring a lawsuit to challenge a government policy just because you dislike it if it doesn't actually affect you. That is a bedrock legal principle. It is written into the Constitution, and there is a tremendous amount of case law confirming that strict standard. So the issue here is that these anti-abortion groups, they do not use mifepristone, they do not prescribe mifepristone, and they have no actual connection to the FDA's regulation of mifepristone other than a desire to see all abortion banned nationwide. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a case that will determine if nationwide restrictions are imposed on access to mifepristone, a safe medication used in more than half of all U.S. abortions, and also for miscarriage treatment. What the court decides later this year will have significant implications on our ability to access abortion, no matter where we live, even in states with legal protections for abortion. The decision could also impact how other medications are protected from interference. That is, the court could decide that anyone who doesn't like a certain medication can levy a lawsuit to block access to the drug. How bananas is that? To unpack what we heard, we have Julia Kay, senior staff attorney at the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project, who is on site in Washington, D.C., and is joining us just hours after hearing the arguments live. Julia, welcome to At Liberty, and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be on the show. So, Julia, we first talked about this case on At Liberty about a year ago. Just hours ago today, you heard the oral arguments for the Mifepristone case, which will determine whether Mifepristone can continue to be prescribed through telehealth, mailed to patients, and dispensed at brick-and-mortar pharmacies. But before we dive into the implications and its impact of this impending decision, I want to refresh our memory on what has led us up to this Supreme Court hearing. What do we need to know about the Mifepristone case? Anti-abortion extremists filed this case a few months after the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade. And they filed it in a district in Texas where they could guarantee that the case would be heard by judges with a record of hostility to abortion. They did this by incorporating a new shell organization in Amarillo, Texas, that seems to have had no other purpose beyond establishing that a lawsuit could be filed in Amarillo, where they would be able to guarantee that the case would be heard by um, Trump-appointed Judge Kaczmarek. The plaintiffs in this case are targeting access to mifepristone because it is used in most abortions in the country. It is safe. It is effective. It has been used by more than 5 million people since the FDA first approved it way back in 2000. It is considered an essential medication by the World Health Organization, and it's used in many countries around the the world. So really, the safety here shouldn't be in question. But that is the hook that these anti-abortion groups are trying to use. They ultimately are arguing that this medication is somehow so unsafe that FDA was wrong to approve it in the first place, wrong to make changes to its regulations relating to mifepristone in subsequent years. Um, And they're ultimately seeking to have this case taken off the market altogether. When they first raised this claim before Judge Kaczmarek and Amarillo. The court there rubber-stamped everything that they requested and actually agreed that this safe, effective, FDA-approved medication should no longer be available anywhere in the country. The case then went up to the ultra-conservative Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, and they 
agreed with virtually all of what Judge Kaczmarek had decided, except that the Fifth Circuit concluded that the challenge to the FDA's original approval of Mifepristone nearly a quarter century ago came too late, that it was, in legal speak, time barred. And so they set that part of the case aside, but otherwise swallowed hook, line, and sinker, everything else that the anti-abortion groups were seeking. It then went up to the U.S. Supreme Court in the spring of 2023 on an emergency application by the government asking the Supreme Court to quickly step in and put the lower court decisions on a hold until the Supreme Court has a chance to evaluate the case. That's what the Supreme Court did. Um, And so that's why we haven't seen these lower court decisions take effect yet. But now we've basically gone back through that whole cycle again. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued another decision very similar to the earlier one, and that got us to the arguments this morning. Wow, a really tangled web. And yet, um, you know, it's also very clear what the opposition is trying to do here. Restricting mifepristone, we know, would be devastating. Um, Allowing mifepristone to be accessed through the mail and at pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS allows all patients, especially low income, people of color and those in rural and red state areas to have better access to this medication. Taking this right away is just one of the many efforts anti-abortion extremists are using to make it far more difficult for people to access abortion nationwide. Besides this impact, what are some of the other high-level implications this ruling will have if the Supreme Court upholds the Fifth Circuit's ruling? In addition to the devastating consequences for folks seeking abortion and miscarriage care, uh, and particularly the communities that you just mentioned, people of color, folks living in rural areas, low-income patients, women with abusive partners, uh, folks who, uh, for whom it would be extremely burdensome and impossible in many cases to have to travel what might be hundreds of miles just to pick up this pill. And, And as you've indicated, that's one of the questions at stake here. But in addition to those reproductive healthcare impacts, We have seen an outpouring of support and, frankly, outrage in this case from pharmaceutical companies, from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and other other patient healthcare advocacy groups who have made clear that if the Supreme Court does what these anti-abortion groups are asking the court to do in this case, it will create a blueprint for any ideologue who opposes a medication to go into court and try to persuade judges to strip away other people's access to essential health care. And it is totally plausible that that would happen, certainly in the context of more politically fraught, if we can say that, topics like vaccines, um, hormone replacement therapy, contraception, medications to prevent and treat HIV AIDS. There are a lot of critically important life-saving medications out there that you could easily find a group of people who happen to disagree with. And that is why patient healthcare advocacy groups outside of the reproductive health space and pharmaceutical companies are so gravely concerned. They are saying that this case could stifle innovation and drug development and research and ultimately interfere with patients' access to all sorts of medications with catastrophic implications. There's no doubt that the implications are far spread and wide-reaching. During the oral arguments, we heard two major lines of questioning from the justices. One pertained to whether or not uh, the anti-abortion extremists who levied this whole lawsuit had what's called legal standing. The other line of question really came around this question that has been levied by the opposition of the question of mifepristone's safety or the process by which the FDA concluded that the mifepristone is safe. I want to talk about the latter first. I want to talk about our commentary, what we believe is the evidence or lack thereof evidence um, behind that claim, that the FDA's process for determining that mifepristone is safe was somehow fallible. In the amicus brief is that that the ACLU, the Center for Reproductive Rights, and the Lawyering Project filed, we explained how the Texas Federal District Court and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals relied on discredited experts and transparently flawed and biased research. How are the anti-abortion extremists 
using the strong science in their testimonies to throw out the FDA's evidence-based decisions. These anti-abortion extremists are trying to manufacture a scientific dispute about the safety of medication abortion that does not actually exist. They do not have a shred of credible scientific evidence. What they have instead put forward is testimony from a handful of individuals who travel the country peddling misinformation about abortion safety. And uh, my colleagues and I at the ACLU and at our sister organizations who do reproductive rights litigation, we know these folks well. We uh, interact with them often. We frequently have the opportunity to question them under oath. Um, And when other courts have heard these witnesses testify, time and again, they have discredited them. They have thrown out the testimony because these witnesses' opinions on abortion are inaccurate, distorted, contrary to the great weight of medical evidence. These are all quotes from court decisions. On top of that, we have some damning admissions from these folks under oath. One witness who was quoted 17 times by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals as a basis to restrict access to Mifepristone nationwide. This witness admitted in a deposition a few years ago that she is not a really good researcher, her words, and that she engages in pervasive plagiarism. You know, the studies that the courts relied on here, just as one illustration, the district judge in Texas based certain findings, allegedly justifying these sweeping restrictions on abortion, on a study of 98 anonymous bloggers on the website Abortion Changes You. Other studies relied on by the Texas judge have been retracted in recent months because they are so profoundly flawed. So there is just no genuine scientific question here. It's junk science. I appreciate you tracing all that for us because um, it is quite alarming (laughs) uh, what is being used uh, as evidence in a Supreme Court case. I just find that to be really quite interesting. You and me both. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And in the oral arguments themselves, we saw a Solicitor General Pulager um, have to really contend with this line of questioning about, quote unquote, safety. I'm wondering what you made of the justices questioning around patient safety and what the data was able to kind of bear out in the arguments themselves. You know, I was struck, frankly, by how few questions there were on the merits of the anti-abortion group's arguments that mifepristone is unsafe. I I think a point that the folks representing outside of the case made, um, I think that they helped explain for the justices that FDA has a tremendous amount of data on mifepristone. For 15 years, the FDA required special reporting by all mifepristone prescribers beyond what the FDA requires for virtually any other drug. And so when the anti-abortion plaintiffs in this case, one of the arguments they've made is that, well, the FDA didn't have sufficient data. The FDA maybe just doesn't know. There are all of these secret complications that are happening that aren't being reported to the FDA. That is nonsense. The FDA- It's conspiratorial, honestly. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. The FDA has had dramatically more uh, data collected about mifepristone than it has had for any other medication in your medicine cabinet today. Right. So I want to go back to what you just brought up, which is this question of legal standing. Um, What is, let's just start basic, what is legal standing? The Constitution says that you cannot bring a lawsuit to challenge a government policy just because you dislike it if it doesn't actually affect you. That is a bedrock legal principle. It is written into the Constitution, and there is a tremendous amount of case law confirming that strict standard. 
So the issue here is that these anti-abortion groups, they do not use mifepristone, they do not prescribe mifepristone, and they have no actual connection to the FDA's regulation of mifepristone other than a desire to see all abortion banned nationwide. Yeah, and that was very that was very clear even in the arguments themselves. And, and to that point, I, I did think that the justices had a significant amount of questions that were about whether or not the opposition actually had legal standing to bring this case um, in the first place, which was uh, refreshing to hear. Um, to that end, it really seemed like the entire case was based on this hypothetical situation and speculative harm that apparently having to either access this medication um, or having to address harms from abortion drugs could uproot a patient or doctor's life, um, despite there being so few adverse effects from mifepristone, as you mentioned. How do we keep ending up with these situations? Yeah, these extremists who want to take away our rights, they are trying to manufacture facts, trying to manufacture controversies, and trying to manipulate the law to serve their ideological goals. And so in this case, I think you hit the nail on the head when you're using the words hypothetical and speculative. That is exactly what we have here. And now let's remember that this is a lawsuit that was brought by the Alliance Defending Freedom Uh, that brought together a number of well-known anti-abortion medical associations, one would assume that the legal team here searched far and wide to find the most compelling stories they possibly could of doctors who have been forced to provide abortions that they were morally opposed to or that who have seen, you know, huge numbers of patients experiencing complications from mifepristone. And so it is extremely telling that they fell so very far short of their goal here. And all they could come up with were a couple of witnesses. Again, you know, these are well-known folks, the same witnesses who have been discredited by court after court. Many of them are affiliated with these anti-abortion medical associations in some way. They're the CEO or they're uh, on the board of directors. And even then, these witnesses could not share a single example of a time when they have been forced to perform an abortion in violation of their conscience, even though that is the premise of the whole case. That's that's their the centerpiece of their argument is that FDA has made regulatory decisions that we believe increase the risk of mifepristone. And sure, the data doesn't actually bear that out, but just trust us, it increases the risk. And there are going to be patients showing up in emergency rooms in droves because it's so very unsafe. And they're going to show up in our emergency rooms. And then we will be the ones who are on call that day. And then we will be forced to provide abortion care or abortion adjacent care. uh, And that will cause us grave moral harm. But you can hear from the sentence I just described how many chains in the link there are and how speculative it is, how attenuated, how hypothetical it is. Um, And we heard a lot of questions from the justices this morning that really dug into that and said, well, show us exactly which of your witnesses actually has had this experience and could credibly uh, fear that they would have this experience in the future. And it was virtually impossible for the lawyer for the other side to point to any examples where that's in fact what the witnesses actually were able to say. Julia, this just is so aggravating. It does seem like a a spaghetti on the wall kind of uh, effort, right? That it just we'll just throw anything we can um, and see what sticks. And unfortunately, we're living in a, a time where certain things stick because of the nature and makeup of our court system. I want to talk about another element of the oral arguments. The Comstock Act was name-checked a number of times. Um, 
during the oral arguments, just as Thomas and Alito kept alluding to reviving the Comstock Act, which could ban medication abortion nationwide, also potentially procedural abortion. What can you tell us about the Comstock Act and how does it actually apply to this case? Yeah, I think there are a lot of people in this country who are hearing the phrase Comstock Act for the first time today and and wondering what that is. So the Comstock Act were a set of anti-obscenity laws from the 1800s that, among other things, um, have language that relates to the mailing of any item or medication for the purpose of abortion. Now, every federal appellate court to have considered the Comstock Act has concluded that this antiquated law would only apply in the context of unlawful abortions, that it has nothing to do with mailing uh, medical equipment or medication for purposes of a lawful abortion. Not only has every federal appellate court to consider that, reach that conclusion, but Congress has bought into that interpretation over and over again um, over the decades. Um, And the Department of Justice issued a very detailed interpretation of the Comstock Act, sharing that same unanimous interpretation. But nevertheless, we have seen, really since Dobbs, anti-abortion groups latch on to this 150-year-old law and push a theory that it can be used not only to ban the use of mail-order pharmacies to fill prescriptions for mifepristone, but actually to ban all abortion nationwide. Because if you can't mail any medical equipment that would be used in an abortion, then you can't fill your clinics and hospitals with the the equipment that you need to provide healthcare. So um, it is very scary that this is being raised. And what's even scarier is that Donald Trump's anti-abortion allies are not only pushing this theory that the Comstock Act could ban all abortion with the stroke of a pen, without any congressional involvement or the American people having any say in it. So setting aside that we think that is utterly without merit, This is a threat that we need to take seriously. And the reason that they are turning to this antiquated law from the 1800s is because they know that every single time abortion has been on the ballot since Dobbs, voters have overwhelmingly chosen to enshrine protections for reproductive freedom and to beat back attacks on abortion. So That's why they feel like they need to manipulate these ancient laws to try to serve their ultimate goal of banning all abortion nationwide. Yeah, it's really important that we are like loud and clear about what they are saying here and that people actually hear the message um, because this is definitely purposeful. You know, I think the overturn of Roe was a clear uh, warning sign that more was to come. And I think people didn't even believe that could have happened, um, even despite warnings from from us and other folks in the repro movement that it would absolutely could happen. So I think, you know, we need to learn the lesson um, of not seeing the overturn of Roe coming and see this as a real threat. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the various implications of the court's decision. Um, I see it as, you know, obviously, first and foremost, the impact it would have on access to reproductive health care, whether that be medication abortion or um, miscarriage care, for that matter. Uh, Julia, would this affect folks all across the country? Yeah, if the Supreme Court decides to impose nationwide restrictions on medication abortion, which is exactly the question before the court today, that will apply in every state in the country, even those with legal protections for abortion. And in fact, it is likely to have the most significant impact on people living in states like California, New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, states that have protections for abortion in place, 
but also have rural parts of the state where folks may live many, many miles away from the nearest uh, mifepristone prescriber. One of the major questions before the court today is whether to strip away a telehealth option for medication abortion uh, that patients across the country have come to rely on since the pandemic. Right now, 16% of all U.S. abortions are happening through a combination of telemedicine evaluations and counseling, and then patients filling their prescriptions through mail order pharmacies or increasingly brick and mortar pharmacies. If the Supreme Court requires patients to travel in person to a hospital, medical office, or clinic just so they can be handed this pill, that will mean that in states like California, patients have to take on the transportation costs, they have to make childcare arrangements, lose wages for time off work, uh, which is a particular concern for folks who work in lower wage, minimum wage jobs and don't have PTO. Um, folks who are in abusive relationships, it can be impossible to escape the surveillance of an abuser uh, while you travel for hours just so you can be handed this pill for no medical reason at all. Um, so it's really scary. And I, I want to just layer one other um, piece of the harm here. So if we lose a telehealth option, that will also mean that clinics in states that do have protections for abortion see even greater demand. And we know that despite the heroic efforts of abortion providers who are in states where um, access remains legal, despite those heroic efforts, they are stretched way beyond capacity because there is now so much demand, not only from people who live in those states, but from folks uh, traveling at great cost and burden across state lines to try to access the care. And so in many cases, there are already multi-week waits for appointments. If the Supreme Court does what these anti-abortion groups want the court to do, they will dramatically reduce where, from whom, and how patients can access this safe medication. And that will further burden the clinics who are trying to shoulder the load of the entire country right now. The process by procuring said medication could become more precarious. It flies in the face of what they claim that they're trying to do. I think precarious is a very good word here to describe the state of our rights. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. So um, the other thing I think that's worthy of of mentioning is if this uh, were to... uh, if the, the Supreme Court were to uphold the circuit decision, just yes, um, then then it would it would impact all of us across the country, which again is really flies in the face of what we heard when Roe was overturned, that the Supreme Court wanted to give the authority of whether or not to uh, ban or allow abortion back to the states. That is exactly right. When anti-abortion groups and extremist politicians told us that overturning Roe was just about sending the issue back to the states, they were lying. The goal was always to ban all abortion nationwide. And we are seeing that play out in this attack on a safe medication used in most abortions in this country. You've got our attention, Julia. We are here. We are listening. We are ready. What can folks do who are concerned? What do what do we want to tell them? I think the single most important thing that folks can do is pay attention and vote. Make sure that your elected officials, folks who are already in office, know your feelings about this. If you are angry about these threats, if you are angry about these attacks, Uh, make your voice heard um, and certainly show up at the polls and uh, make sure that this election does not pass you by because the stakes could not be higher. Okay, my final question for you, Julia. You were on the ground. You got to hear the arguments yourself. Uh, How did it feel sitting there 
Um, and what did what were your impressions based on what you heard? This case should have been laughed out of court from the start. So while I was heartened by the skepticism that some of the justices were expressing about whether these anti-abortion groups should have been allowed to move forward with this case in the first place, I kept thinking to myself, how did we even get here? And it is simply preposterous that we are having to defend access to this safe, effective FDA-approved medication that has been used in the United States for a quarter century. So, you know, it's it's encouraging that the justices were pushing hard on some of the claims by these plaintiffs, but it is a very sad state of affairs that we are having to defend the safety of this medication in the first place. I feel that. Thank you so much, Julia, for joining us and for helping us parse through what you heard on the ground and how we can all be a part of fighting back. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. Until next week, stay strong. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by the folks at Ultraviolet Audio. Genesis McPayo is our intern. <laughs>